Greetings and welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rossner, keeping this intro very short because we have a lot to talk about about the economy with economist and senior lecturer at the UWI, Dr. Roger Hussein. Dr. Hussein, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for the invitation. And I think we're still close enough to independence for me to, to wish you independence greetings. But I want to know, some people say 60 years, we're still very young. But what do you see the lay of the land as in terms of what does our economy look like 60 years on in independence? Well, I think we have made a lot of progress. 60 years on, I mean, if, if, if you were to look at the hard facts, one would see that per capita GDP, for example, at around 1962 was just about 700 US per capita, and today it's about 16,000 US per capita. So, so that's a dramatic increase. And there are much more people in China and Tobago today will have electricity and water as compared to 1962. Much more people would be in, 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 you know, have received a primary school education, a secondary school education, and even a tertiary level education. So, many regards, we have made tremendous progress. What I would, would say, though, is whether or not <laughs> this tremendous progress since 1962 is alignment with an economy that produced 9.2 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent, because that's the amount we have produced since 1962, and generated about 75 billion US dollars in current dollars in energy rents. I would say no, DK. I would say no, there is much, much more room <coughs> for improvement, and we could have done much better. And it's an important moment. Um, the day, August the 31st, would have gone, but we are still very much in our 60th year celebration. And so I would say that it's an important moment for reflection for the government of Trinidad and Tobago as to how we could accelerate our economy even further in the next 60 years as we continue to generate more oil and gas. And, you know, the obvious question is then why? Why did we underachieve? Why? Are we, in some regards, an, an underachieving society, as, 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 as Dr. Terence Farrell would say? Well, one of the things that we really, really got wrong, in my view, especially after 2001, is the way we spent the energy rents. Now, before 2001, energy rents, as a uh, transfers and subsidies as a proportion of energy rents hardly ever crossed 100%. But as 2001 in the 60-year cycle came, we in 2001 in particular, transfers and subsidies accounted for 57% of energy rents. But as time passed and we, we came closer to 2022, more and more chances and subsidies accounted for all of the energy rents. Indeed, in, in, there were years after 2008 where all of the energy rents and some non-energy revenues were spent on chances and subsidies. And that made the Trinidad and Tobago economy a very skewed place, a skewed place in favor of chances and subsidies, a skewed place against Capital injections. Now, as you would know and others would know, capital injections into the economy are critical because as you place and input more capital into the economy, you widen productive space. You give the economy a greater chance to, to grow. And our capital injections, certainly since around 1983 has been on the decline. And while there has been a, a, a gentle increase between 2004 and 2014, certainly after 2014, it has been contracting. So that's where I think some of the biggest gains could have been made 
in the last 60 years as regards the use of this precious energy rents that we extract from the ground by converting oil and gas that we extract into, into monetary resources. And the let, final... me, let, me, let me pause for a second. Yeah, okay, yes, the distance of... I like the fact that you're citing dates, you're citing times, you're citing amounts. And with that, I want to bring us right here because we'll go back and go forward a little bit more. But I want us to talk a little bit about your views on the spotlight on the economy uh, and also giving some of the rationale behind your the, 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 uh, the articulation that you have at first blush. Right. Well, I, I, I read the PowerPoint presented by the Minister of Finance and by the permanent secretary in the Minister, Ministry of Finance. And after reading the PowerPoint presented by the Minister of Finance, I, I saw, saw, saw some errors in there. I saw some things that I disagreed with. And I, it, was, it was good to see um, some of the energy revenue figures that, that the Minister mentioned. But what was very disheartening to me, DK, was that the data that the Minister of Finance presented showed that 2021 was actually a year of negative economic activity. So, and here one of his graphs showed that for the period 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021 were all contractionary years. That means we are in a depression. If you look at the numbers that the Minister of Finance presented, you would, and you, and you, and you use <coughs> compounded figures, you would realize that in 2022, we are about 18% smaller in size using real GDP than we were in 2015. And that, that was surprising to me. I mean, I know these numbers. I was really hoping that 2021, based on some comments that the Minister of Finance made at the mid-year review, will turn out to be positive. Instead, it turned out to be negative as well. So, again, when I looked at the numbers from the... Minister of Finance in his PowerPoint presentation in conjunction with the data from the Central Statistical Office that was released about two weeks ago. What has me surprised is that although the economy experienced a depreciation in the real effective exchange rate of about 4.5% between 2015 and 2021, I was really surprised to see that the ratio of non-energy non-tradables to non-energy tradables on the rise. Now, what that means to someone like me is that the 4.5% depreciation was insufficient to stimulate a resource reallocation in favor of the non-energy tradable sector and rather our economy in the period 2015 to 2021, drifted further towards the production of non-energy, non-tradables. Now, why is that important? The, it is important for people to understand that because the more non-energy, non-tradable activity you have in the economy is the greater the demand on foreign exchange. And if you look at the data, you would see that in combination of, on, on the slides presented on the spotlight, you would see we have somewhere about $6 billion in international reserves, about 8.2 or 8.4 um, months of import cover that I mentioned there. But when you look at the external debt figures that were presented, you would realize that if you extract from the international reserve the external debt numbers on an annual basis, then you would see a line that just keeps going down and down southwards to show that, in effect, in a raw crude way, DK, our stock of reserves, less the external debt, is really very low. And so I, I was surprised when I saw some of the numbers. And somehow the Minister of Finance was able to speak about this in glowing terms. And I am happy that he had the capacity to do that. To me, I saw some worrying numbers. and. Uh, uh, add some worrying numbers there in, in, in uh, when he, what he presented. 
And I want to I want to talk about those worrying numbers in just a bit, but we have about two minutes on this side of the conversation. And I want to raise two points and ask you to respond to them, please. Uh I'm not sure if this will be quibbling, uh, but what if if answer the person who would want to push back and said, Well, 2019, it just cleared that hurdle so that figures didn't depreciate. And what about if non-energy, non-tradables are being created here in a matter of not trying to increase foreign debt? How would you answer those two points? Right. But I wasn't clear on the first part of the point. Uh, I understand the second part clearly, but the first point part I didn't understand. I think you, you spoke about you, you spoke about the figures dropping from 2016 to 2022. And I think right. in 20, 2019, I think it would have just cleared so that it was not it was not dropped. Right. So I am I'm referring here to the Minister of Finance numbers. Eh? If you look at the PowerPoint, you would see every single year was less than zero. Even 2019, to which you refer, was minus 0 0.2. So DK, as a hardcore economist, when I saw that graph, I felt very depressed. It meant that our economy is ranked in the top 20 worst performing economies in the world in the time period 2016 to 2021. Now, that's not a statistic I am proud about. I, 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 I was shocked. And I felt very sad for Trinidad and Tobago in the context of when I saw the minister's presentation, I thought 2019 was actually positive. Eh? But the minister himself, whose numbers I have confidence in, uh, 2019 was minus 0 0.2. And you could go back and check the graph yourself, or I could pull it up here for you. I have it somewhere about, but it was minus 0 0.2. And so, also... If you look at IMF data, and I refer to IMF data because whilst other people mentioned that 2021 would probably be an economic growth year or have um, different numbers, the IMF since March and probably even since November last year called 2021 to be minus 1%. And lo and behold, when CSO data came out, it was actually minus 1%. So they have a sound, robust, technologically sophisticated statistical model. And this same IMF is saying in 2022, 2023, and 2024, the economy would improve. And we take that. But then, using the IMF numbers, after the little natural gas improvements in 22, 23, and 24 DK, you see something startlingly worrying happening. You see, and, in 20... and even before you tell me about what is going to be startlingly happening, let's take a short break and we come back with more. We're speaking with Dr. Roger Hussein about the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Stay with us. We'll return with more. Welcome back. We are going in-depth on the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. We're doing so with a senior lecturer as well as economist, Dr. Roger Hussein. And I broke I broke you during it, broke you off in during your train of thought, doctor. So you said something startling looking to happen. Uh, you worry in. Yes, please. Uh, according to the IMF data, if you look at 2025, 2026, and 2027, in other words, so you come down. In the last six years, to the bottom of a depression, 22, 23, and 24, you will see some economic activity because of the improvement in natural gas and so on. But then in 25, 26, and 27, the economy, if you do a relative ranking of all economies in the world for which forecast numbers are available, there are about 195, Trinidad and Tobago goes back to being ranked 8th, 10th, and 9th worst in the world in terms of economic performance. And you can look at the data yourself, DK, and, and it is there for, it, for the world to see. Now, that has me concerned, and it says to me that something is wrong with this model, this economic structure of the Trinidad and Tobago economy that is generating economic activity. And what I would urge the Minister of Finance, I will say to him, reform the Economic Development Advisory Board. Bring back Terence Farrell as sound scientifically trained high-level professional economists to lead that economic development advisorial board and bring ideas that could help make nonsense of the IMF predictions. Because, I mean, it is not a nice feeling, DK, to see 
that your economy collapsed to eight, ten, and ninth worst performing in the world in 2025, 26, and 27. People will migrate. My, my children would want to run away. Other people's children would want to run away because as your economy collapses like that, other things will increase, like crime and, and so on. And we could avoid that. But my humble, honest view, and I tend to be very blunt, is that there is no harm in supporting the Ministry of Finance with a team of hardcore, technically well-trained economists and financial specialists to support the work of the Minister of Finance and his colleagues. So you get two sets of, of ideas, one from the politicians and one from the technocrat. And somewhere in between, I suspect the best solution for Trinidad and Tobago would lie. That would be my honest advice. But I think sometimes in, in between that medium you're talking about, I think sometimes that is where all the cracks exist or most of the cracks. And I say that because you can say things, you can use words like you can uh, the capital injection, transfer and subsidies, and terms that you are very comfortable using as an economist. Other technocrats can use terms that they're very comfortable using. But is it a matter of just dealing with it from policy standpoint or getting buy-in so that the man on the streets know, knows that, okay, well, this is what they mean when they say this, and this is why it makes sense. So we can change our mindset to help with that buy-in. So while people are trying to show up Forex on one side, we're not saying, nah, man, we're going to do what we used to be doing all the time, what we are accustomed to doing, and not changing that mindset to, 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 to combat or to mitigate that forecast, even though the information is already there. What do you say to that? I would say very good point. I would say um, maybe we could, we could swap chairs a little, and then I would go on to say two responses. I would say that the Economic Development Advisorial Board is not meant to break this thing down to the man on the street. The Economic Development, Dev Development Advisorial Board is only to talk to the Minister of Finance and his top um, appointees and provide them with the same terms you mentioned. What is the trend in transfers and subsidies, capital injections, and so on? Hardcore facts that the Minister understand and his technical people would understand. And then I would say to you, there is another layer where probably people like the Minister of Finance and other technocrats have to speak to the man and woman on the floor. And that's where you say, well, Whilst Lara is a decrease and Lara is making a lot of runs, the West Indies would look good. But when Lara is no longer there, you need someone else there like manufacturing sector to help keep the West Indies team together and make runs. So the Minister of Finance, and he is very capable, has to be, to, in my opinion, be articulate enough to present it in two layers. One, to deal with the sophisticated EDA board, which I am sure they are able to do. And at the same point in time, use a language that appeals to the man and woman on the street of the form that I just used. And I hope my example made sense to you. It did. So if you were, if, if you were to say some of these things, what are some of these suggestions that you might have uh, versus just saying something like tightening your belt? Right. So I would say, so, so you want me to, to speak as if I am from the Economic Development Advisorial Board or you want me to speak to the man on the street? Man on the street, thank you. Right. I would say to them, listen, I expect Argentina to win the World Cup this year because Messi is of a talent and capacity that is unparalleled and probably unmatched so that when he goes out there, I expect Argentina, as they did in the Copa America recently, to excel and probably win. I'm also telling you my favorite team. At the same point in time, people, if it is Messi for some reasons become injured, in other words, oil production and gas production and prices were to fall, then I cannot see the production function that is the Argentinian football team producing of the same level and capacity as if Messi is there. And therefore, for Argentina to really have a good chance in World Cup 2024, they need to have a team that is less dependent on Messi with more resilient strikers, defenders and midfielders and that could hold their own in the event that Messi has a bad day. And I would imagine, because I still play football in my village, that the average person I tell that to on the field would understand and take that and then interpret that accordingly. And I hope it made sense to you. It made sense, but I can I can I can hear someone saying, Doc, you had me from jump 
until you start to talk about Argentina winning the World Cup. Because, <laughs> but I like the analogy still. <laughs> but for, but funnily enough, I hope hope this is part one of this conversation because definitely this is something that we can't uh, dive as deep as we'd want to in just 20 minutes. But Dr. Roger Hussein, thank you so much for helping us think about some things and start to wrap our minds so that the next time we, we have a conversation like this, we can go even further. But thank you very much. No problem. It's my absolute pleasure and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Yes, sir. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us.